here. So uh, my name is Laura Tutsoyu. I'm the director of research for the ACD. And uh, together with Dr. Longo, we're going to be moderating the session. I'll introduce the speakers. So session number two is again focused on preclinical models of creating deficiencies. And we have speakers from Italy and the US and Canada. And um, we're covering all three CCDS mice models. Uh, and our first speaker is Dr. Elsa Girardini from the Institute of Neuroscience at the National Research Council in Italy. And we're going to talk again about potential for gene therapy. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning to everyone. And thanks for the chance of sharing our work with you today. I believe that after nice presentations from the previous speakers, I don't need to spend any more words on what CTD is. So I will just start by stressing the fact that as opposed as the other two creatine deficiency syndromes, CTD does not benefit from creatine supplementation and is therefore essential to devise alternative therapeutic approaches. In our lab, we're working on two strategies. On the one hand, we want to identify the cellular and molecular pathways that are mostly impacted by the disease so that we can tailor specific therapies or even repurpose already existing drugs. On the other hand, we want to act at the most radical level by correcting the genetic defect through gene therapy, which is also a particularly appealing solution because ideally it would allow to obtain a lifelong correction of the disease, possibly with a single lowly invasive treatment. <clears throat> For all our purposes, we work on a CTD mouse model that the, our group developed a few years ago. Our mice carry a deletion in a portion of the gene that encodes for the creatine transporter, or CRT, that results in the absence of the functional protein in the males. And this resembles very closely what happens in the patients because, for example, these animals have um, global cognitive impairment that we can see when we measure different types of memories, for example, uh, spatial declarative and, uh, no, sorry, working declarative and spatial memory. They have uh, enhanced repetitive stereotypic behaviors, for example, excessive self-grooming, which are typical traits of the autism spectrum disorder. And they are subject to spontaneous epileptic seizures and they develop more severe epilepsy in response to uh, epileptogenic agents, for example, kinate. So with this reliable model by our side, we now want to understand the pathogenic mechanisms of CTD. And in particular, we want to know what are the cellular and physiological alterations in the brain and what types of cells are particularly vulnerable. But before we start, let's take a look at where CRT is expressed in the brain. If we look, for example, at data from publicly available databases like the Allenbrain Atlas, we can see that CRT is expressed in both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and in one class of non-neuronal cells called oligodendrocytes. But it's not present elsewhere, for example, in astrocytes, vascular cells, or microglia, which are the immune cells of the brain. So we can reasonably expect CTD to differently affect all these populations. To verify this, we performed a single nucleus RNA sequencing study. Um, this is a technique that allows to determine with high precision the identity of every single cell of the brain and how genes are expressed in it. In our case, we wanted to know whether CTD induced macroscopic alterations in the brain in terms of cell composition and or more subtle changes in gene expression. So when we ran our experiments, we saw that uh, we didn't notice any differences in the brain composition of CTD animals. We did, however, notice an effect on gene expression within the individual classes of cells. These plots here represent the genes that are expressed differently in the knockouts. In red are the overexpressed and in blue the underexpressed. And as you can see, there are several of these differentially expressed genes in some, but not all, the cell types meaning that um, in particular, in those that are supposed to express CRT. We then started to dig into these differential expressed genes and we identified some specific pathways, especially those related to the regulation of synapses, which have to do with the ways that neurons communicate with each other as recurrently altered across the different cell types. We are now in the process of validating this data with other techniques, and we hope by this to be able to identify specifically altered pathways that can represent possible therapeutic targets. Now, looking into uh, the cell-specific vulnerability to CTD, our attention was caught by um, a particular type of inhibitory neurons called PV neurons, parvalbumin neurons. 
These are the most abundant class of inhibitor in neurons, and they're involved in the regulation of several cognitive processes. They're also very active. They fire action potentials with very high frequency, and this is a process that requires a lot of energy. Also, they express high levels of CRT, but they don't have the enzymes for the endogenous synthesis of creatine meaning that they need a lot of creatine, but they can only rely from the exogenous supply. And of course, all these characteristics make PV neurons particularly interesting candidates for us to study. In a previous work, we had already detected a decrease in the number of inhibitory synapses in general in the brain of CTD animals. Now we have data suggesting that also the specific synaptic contexts of PV neurons are decreased, even if the number of PV cells is normal. And when we looked at the functional properties of these neurons, we saw that the membrane currents that mediate the generation of action potentials and therefore neurotransmission are reduced in knockout and in PV neurons from the knockout brain. And consistently, when we stimulate these neurons with electric current, they reach lower firing frequencies and their action potentials are slower compared to the controls. Finally, the knockout neurons fail to maintain their response to intense stimulation. All in all, this complex set of data tells us that um, PB neurons from the knockout brain are less functional and more prone to fatigue. And finally, to establish the contribution of this defect to uh, CTD symptoms, we generated mice in which the transporter is only absent in PB neurons. And we saw that this was enough to induce cognitive impairment here. For example, you can see the lower performance in this particular behavioral task called Y-maze and increased susceptibility to a kinase-induced epilepsy. So to conclude this first part, with single nucleus RNA sequencing, we identified cell-specific alterations in gene expression. And we now have an extensive database to use in search for um, interesting alterations and possible therapeutic targets. And we have already identified PV neurons as particularly vulnerable to the lack of creatine, establishing that their dysfunction is enough to generate CTD symptoms. <clears throat> I will now spend my last few minutes on the gene therapy protocol that we are implementing in our lab. Um, because CTD is caused by mutations that inactivate or reduce the activity of the transporter, the idea is of course to introduce in the cells a healthy gene that will be used to uh, produce a functional transporter. To this purpose, we also generated an AAB vector similar to that described by Professor Bresen, carrying the sequence of the human gene. A very important feature of a vector is the promoter, which is a sequence of DNA next to the gene that determines in what type of cells and how much the gene will be expressed. Because we wanted to start by having CRT expressed widely across, across the brain, we chose the CAG promoter, which is strong and ubiquitous, meaning that the gene would be expressed at high levels and in, in all cell types. And the first test on cells told us that uh, the vector, as we designed it, was functional because it increased the cellular levels of creatine and it uh, restored brain, uh, no, it restored creatine levels in skin fibroblasts obtained from our knockout mice. So we moved forward to in vivo testing and we administered the vector directly into the cerebral ventricles of newborn mice, starting with high doses of 10 to the 10 viral genomes per mouse. After four weeks, we were able to detect the expression of the transgene, which is a gene carried by the vector, in the brain of the treated animals. Here, for example, you can see brain uh, protein extracts and the green band is the transgene. Also, protein levels were increased and back to normal in one of that animal. Unfortunately, we also detected high levels of toxicity accompanied by neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. Here, for example, you can see how thinned the cortical thickness is, and you can appreciate the recruitment of immune cells in green. So we decided to scale down the dose by a factor of 10, and we repeated the experiments with a dose of 10 to the nine viral genomes per mouse. Because this dose was not toxic, we waited for 12 weeks and we ran behavioral tests. Now, 
uh, brain creatine levels were partially recovered in some individuals, but overall we did not notice any improvement in cognitive performance. And indeed, when we looked at the distribution of the vector in the brain here in red, we noticed quite a sparse pattern, suggesting that the amount of vector was too low to uh, reach a sufficient number of cells. So we decided to change strategy and we generated another vector where we replaced a CAG promoter with a weaker promoter called JET, so that we could go back to use high doses of the vector obtaining a more widespread distribution, but with a lower, more tolerable expression. And indeed, with a dose of 10 to the 10, the transgene distribution was more uniform. But again, to our surprise, also this treatment was highly toxic and scaling down the dose by one half and one fifth, or two one half and one fifth, uh, didn't reduce toxicity. And when we looked at brain creatine levels, we saw that there was a massive overload of creatine with all the doses, suggesting that even this vector was too strong. An alternative explanation based on what we know about the cell-specific expression of CRT is that uh, the ubiquitous expression per se might be the problem because the gene maybe shouldn't be expressed uh, in cells that are not supposed to have it. And in this case, we would need to turn to cell-specific vectors targeting, for example, only neurons and oligodendrocytes. So to conclude, we generated a vector that is capable of inducing the expression of a functional CRT and to increase brain creatine levels. We failed, however, to find a compromise between safety and efficacy of this treatment, and we suspect that this, with this approach, the therapeutic window might be small. So we now have to work on the fine tuning of the vector by either further adjusting the dosage or by turning to uh, cell specific vectors. I would just like to conclude by thanking all the people that made uh, all this work possible, starting from everyone who helped in Laura Baroncelli's and Tomas Bizzarus's lab, the cl clinicians at the Stella Maris Foundation, our collaborators from the Lopez Atalaya Martinez lab in Alicante, Spain, who performed the single nucleus RNA sequencing study, everyone who helped, the funding agencies and the associations of patients for their support, and of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Girardini. This was wonderful. Um, I think it's always good to see results, even if they may not turn out the way we expect them, and there's more research to do. So not yet. A... <laughs> not yet, exactly. Um, so a quick announcement from the previous session. We had such a wonderful discussion that we're continuing it over chat. So the speakers from the previous session, please take a minute to look at the questions that were posted and you can go ahead and answer them. Um, and now changing gears a little bit, our next talk is gonna be by Dr. Alex Kwan from University of Virginia. And Dr. Kwan actually presented at the 2018 in-person conference on intranasal creatine administration. Um, and this was an interesting path to kind of bypass the blood brain barrier. And I look forward to seeing the latest results. Dr. Kwan, please take it away. All right, so I'm based at the University of Virginia and Department of Neuroscience. So one of my interests is the brain energetic. I want to wonder where the brain energy comes from, or also how the brain keeps the homeostasis in normal condition, also under the stress. So as we know, for the brain to function, we need energy, which means we need ATP, and then there are several ways we can together keep the brain, the ATP level in the homeostasis. One thing is the main part is goes through the mitochondrial respiration, so-called the oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP. This is a required oxygen. So for the brain, we have only 2% of body mass, but we use about 20% of oxygen consumption. So this obviously mitochondrial is important to generate ATP. But besides that, actually, another important aspect is the glycolysis which, as you know, glucose make a lactate. This is less efficient, only generate two ATP per glucose, but it's faster. But actually, and then it's indirectly, this is the basis for our functional MI. So this is a two well-known source for ATP generation. Behind all the things, the backdrop is for the brain there. This is always keep a balance between the mTOR and autophagy signaling pathway. mTOR, that is biosynthesis, makes synapse, make the okay, cell organelle when there's adequate energy. But when there's energy depletion then, okay, under the energy crisis, now you have autophagy, self-eating. 
for the cell. So now we will consume the cellular organelle, try to generate ATP. So with this, this is a component player for to keep the brain ATP. There's a one thing which I think is very important, but with less appreciate that is phosphor creatine and creatine. So phosphor creatine actually, so as you can see here, then it goes through this uh, conversion. So when you have ATP, use that to become ADP. And then if you have one phosphor creatine, now it goes through the creatine kinase, they go to quickly replenish the ADP. This is a very fast reaction, even faster than glycolysis. Also in the cell, in the brain there, we have 10 times more phosphor creatine than the ATP. So there's a lot of energy reserve. And not just that, also it's kind of, uh, this reaction is uh, mediated by the creatine kinase, which is strategically located at the site of mitochondrial production, like mitochondrial. Also at the site of mitochondrial uh, ATP consumption in the muscle, it will be like a mild fibrin. So this way then, so when the ATP is generated, it's gonna to convert to the phosphor creatine, which is smaller, lighter, so it's gonna transfer the field faster. And when you go to the mild fibrin, and then can quickly replenish the ADP, which can also avoid the cell become too excited because uh, avoid, absorb the proton. So this way you have this energy shuttle. This is the idea, what we know about the, uh, okay, phosphor creatine. And actually, and I'm very interested to know what is the role of phosphor creatine and creatine in turn for keep the brain energy homeostasis when the brain is under the stress. Okay, so now we need to think about a little bit of creating the synthesis. So on from the textbook, I think we know about for the normal normal diet patient, we have around 50% of the creatine come from the food, mainly from the meat or the, the fish, herring. So creatine in Latin means the meat. It was uh, initially discovered in 1832. And then the, let me see, 15 years later, and the famous German the, uh, chemist, the uh, Liebig, so he optimized the creatine extraction method. So several years later, so he made a company, start to make this uh, extract of this creatine. You can make a food as a flavor. Apparently his business is very good. So even at times there must be a lot of imitation knockoff. Okay, so this is a history about the creatine, but this is only from the diet. But actually, we know that in the body, we also have an endogenous biosynthesis process. This comes from two amino acids, arginine and glycine, and this goes through the, <coughs> the first enzyme, sorry, again, mainly in the kidney. As you can see here, if you have a normal tissue in the dog, brain, kidney, and liver, again, expressed, uh, highly expressed in terms of the immune block protein in the kidney. And then from this, uh, you have a, a quantity acidity that will transport into the liver and then through another enzyme again. And then so this will make the, let me see, the, into the creatine. And then from the creatine, then you require the creatine transporter to transport into the brain, heart, and muscle, I believe. Okay. And then so this way then, now you can the brain then, they can store to do this synthesis. Okay. One thing I like to point out that is uh, in our study, we found that is uh, if we look at a three day old mouse pop, look at the brain, there's a much higher level of egg expression compared to adult brain. Also lower, okay, but still higher than the adult level gamut expression of the brain. So we think there may be some embryonic uh, in situ biosynthesis of creatine, which probably during the perinatal stage is downregulated of these two uh, creatine synthesis enzymes. And of course, this is what kind of mechanism for this regulation. I think this could be something for the future study. And maybe another way we can think about the potential treatment for the creatine trans uh, transport deficiency. So when we lack this uh, synthesis enzyme, again, again, so this will create a cerebral creatine deficiency syndrome. Mainly the deficit will be intellectual disability. And you can imagine for these two enzyme defect, so they respond well to the oral creatine supplement treatment because the creatine transporter is still there. But if you have a creatine transporter deficiency, which was first identified in 2001, reported by my uh, good friend, Dr. DeGore, and also Dr. Simon Lance. So when they found this there, so in this patient, and then they have an intellectual disability. And when they did the proton MIS, you can see here in the normal brain, there's a creatine peak, which is almost absent in this, uh, in this patient, but they still have a maintained a normal the serum and urine creatine level. So they suspect they may be the transporter deficit and they actually turn out to that is the case. So this is a second highest case, uh, course for the X chromosome linked intellectual disability. So it's dominant in the male.
And then actually, it's because it lack creatine transporter, so it responds poorly to the oral creatine supplement. So this is a uh, okay, a med medical need. We try to understand why okay cause the uh, this uh, okay disability in the creatine transport deficit and how to treat it. So when we come back to think about a little bit about why they respond poorly to the oral creatine supplement, that is because it's a very slow kinetic of creatine recovery in the brain, okay, the uptake. So you can imagine in this particular paper previous published, they used the game, the mutamide. So the brain level creatine is low. And then it tries to feed them with creatine in drinking water. As you can see here, it takes two weeks for the brain, the level of creatine to be replenished. So it's very slow, the process. Why is that? I think the idea that is uh, probably based on previous okay study, especially by the Dr. Bresan, that is with idea that is uh, the creatine transporter is expressed in the endothelial cell, but likely it's not expressed in atrocyte and fit. So this create a barrier. So uh, make uh, the pack cross the problem barrier become very inefficient. And in our study, then we also made the creatine knockout mice. In our knockout construct, there's a like the input into a creatine transporter at first exon, the exon region. So you can see here, then, then we use the anti lag Z, the immune EN. So we can show here highly expressed in the endothelial cell, but actually not much in the surrounding cell, like atrocytic amphib. So I think actually this will support this idea. And I should say one more thing that is the creatine transporter, it does facilitate the creatine transport into a neuron. So we will compare the white type versus creatine transporter knockout neuron. The one we're feeding with the creatine in the media, it is less efficient compared to white type uh, neuron. But it seems to me this could be other mechanism to uptake creatine to some degree less efficient into a neuron. So this is all the information background I have. So put it together then, we want to understand that is okay in the creatine knockout mice, is any kind of structural abnormality that we can explain their cognitive function deficit as previous as several study had demonstrated and how they respond to the brain stress. Okay, so when we make this knockout mice, so we can dem so skip this part. We made this mice and we can demonstrate in the brain that the normal creatine peak is greatly reduced in our knockout mice. Also, when we check the messaging RA, the expression creatine transporter in the brain, in the heart, in the muscle is all reduced. Okay, and then they do not have a compensatory the upregulation of again again in the the brain. Okay, so in this mice, then when we look at the the structure, you can see here this will be the normal mice cross with the cell one YP, and this are mutant mice cross with cell one YP. So you can see the dendritic spine. For the normal white type mice, you have a lot of this kind of mushroom type of the dendritic spine. This is where the neuron contact you have seen formation. And then in the creatine knockout mice, you have very thin dendritic spine. And then also, let me see, the density is reduced. Also, you have immature thin form, but reduction of mushroom form. Also, we do the immune staining to count the synapse is also reduced. So this kind of defect could explain the cognitive deficit as a function of a okay, defect that previous uh, people have reported. And then for our interest then I want to know that is in this mutant mice, how they respond to the energy crisis. So the first model we test that is the neonate mice, we separate the pups from the mother. So you have a starvation. And then we want to look at their MMPK autophagy signal pathway, also and the mTOR signaling pathway. So autophagy, as I said, this is a cell eating. So when autophagy is increased, then you can see here, there's an empty hole in the cell. So this is the white eye mice with mother, well-fed. So you do not have this kind of abnormal autophagy structure. On the starvation, you see increase. And then this is a knockout mice, even with the mother pop. Okay, then you still see a lot of the autoph autophagy vesicle. And then on the starvation, this even increased more. And this not just by EN, you can also uh, demonstrate this based on second pathway. Mainly this regulation is by particular alternative uh, phosphorylation in the ULK. So when the serum 3117 is activated, you see autophagy. If 375-57 is a, a phosphorylate, you see suppression autophagy. Now you can see here, white type, not called, without and with the starvation, just following the same order like here. You can see here, Okay, even without starvation in the knockout mass, you really have increased MPK, increased serine, serine 3117, so increased autophagy. 
and then reduction of mTOR pathway under stress is become even more pronounced. And then, and then also you can see mTOR phosphorylation is completely gone. So this is the okay, skill towards the MPK and autophagy. We think that you try to compensate for the energy, the deficiency. And then if we give you more severe challenge like oxygen glucose deprivation, in a wide time neuron, you do not see that much mitochondrial superoxide. But then in the knockout mice, then creating knockout mice, then you can see a lot of increased the uh, okay, mitochondrial ox reactive oxygen species. So because of that, so actually you can imagine when we check treat the whole animal with the ischemia. So we use the cerebral MCA, okay, the thrombosis, And then we only select do this in the P16 before they become weak, small in size. So this is at this stage, that's still relatively healthy. So you can see here that. Okay, so this will be white type mice with infarction, and this will be a knockout mice with a largely, greatly significantly increased infarct myelin, as you can see here. So now we think about how, whether we can try to treat it, we can salvage it, prevent this event. So we think about two different treatments. One is the so-called intranasal delivery iron. The other is IP intraperitoneal. You can think about just like IP IV treatment is creating it. So for this IV treatment, that you still need to go through the broadband barrier, concentrate the creatine transporter to get into the brain. But then in the creatine knockout mice, because they lack this transporter, we think IP injection probably will not be that effective. Even in the knockout, in the white hand mice, this may be a slow process, it may not be working that well. But for intranasal, so I did this. So actually, people previously already used this one to do intranasal injection on insulin and based on the olfactory nerve. And then you can see like a Swiss uh, cheese. This is like a hole. So you can penetrate through into the CSF. So this way you can bypass problem barrier. So we try to compare these two. And you can see here for the creatine transfer non call, if we do the IP injection of supplemental creatine after the stroke, there's really not a much reduction. But then for this intranasal delivery, you can see reduction of infant size. Even in the white hand mice, the IP, no effect. Intranasal looks like there's some effect. And we can confirm this studies in the knockout mice then, okay, without the intranasal creatine supplement, the creatine peak is low, especially compared to the NAA, unlike a white hand mice creatine to a ratio is, a, okay, it's around the 0.5 or 0.6. And then when we treat it with the intranasal creatine, you can see here, the creatine peak increase and then make this ratio increase. And then also you can see here that uh, white type knockout without and with the treatment. Without, with, without the treatment, you can see a lot of NPK, but here that after we treat it with intranasal, so NPK signal reduced. Also, you can see here the caspase 3 activation is reduced. And then we can confirm here that is a, this is a blood flow right away after photosomosis. This is 24 hours the next day after the photosomosis. So Alex, white type is Alex, this is fascinating, and you know, yeah. clearly there are some very promising results here. Um, I think we're going to have to reference the paper, and thanks so much for presenting these results. We're going to come back in the Q&A, but in the interest of time, um, I would like to invite uh, Madeline to, um, okay. to sure. share her screen. And, sure. and again, thanks so much, Alex. No problem. So Madeline is joining us from University of Toronto, where she's been working with Dr. Schulze. Um, who's always a uh, very welcome presence in the ACD community. Um, and she's going to talk about uh, mice model in gamma deficient mice. Madeline, please take it away. Hi, so I'm Madeline. And as you mentioned, I'm an undergraduate student working in the Schultz lab. I want to start by acknowledging and, oops, and thanking the other members of my lab for letting me work on this project and for their help and contributions and also thank the conference organizers for putting together this event. But to not waste time and get right into it, our research pertains to the use of a GAMP deficient mouse model to investigate the biochemical effects of creatine supplementation. For some background, clinically, we know that oral creatine supplementation is a successful therapy in both AGA and GAMP deficiency. It is able to elevate the depleted creatine levels diagnostic of each deficiency. But what has yet to be measured and demonstrated is how the creatine supplementation affects each organ in the body, as well as the mechanism to why it is an effective treatment and the limit of its therapeutic ability. And so our three objectives essentially were to measure and demonstrate these unknowns. First, we wanted to investigate the effect of creatine expression or sorry, the effect of creatine on agar expression and the metabolic intermediates of the creatine biosynthetic pathway. 
Second, we wanted to demonstrate the regulatory mechanism of the pathway. And third, we wanted to evaluate the efficacy of creatine supplementation as a treatment. When investigating the biochemical effects of creatine supplementation, this involves us looking at the metabolites and the enzymes, which are important in creatine synthesis and its regulation. This includes how creatine supplementation affects agot, the first and the rate limiting enzyme of the pathway, and guanidino acetate, or as I refer to it as GAA levels. Because creatine biosynthesis occurs sequentially first in the kidney and then in the liver, and creatine itself is primarily used in the muscles and brain, we aim to measure the biochemical effect of creatine supplementation in each of the organs important in either its biosynthesis or its utilization. So this includes the kidney, liver, skeletal muscle, which we use calf, brain, and heart. Our second goal was to demonstrate the regulatory mechanism of creatine-mediated agot suppression. So creatine is synthesized endogenously through the sequential activity of enzymes agot and GAMT, and it can inhibit its own biosynthesis through a negative feedback mechanism to agot. With this regulatory mechanism, when we supplement with creatine, we would expect to see reduced agot gene and protein expression. And therefore, we aim to measure agot expression to elucidate this proposed mechanism. Our third goal was to evaluate the efficacy of creatine supplementation as a treatment for GAMP deficiency. An effective treatment would hypothetically be able to normalize the abnormal metabolite levels diagnostic of GAMP deficiency, such as depleted creatine and elevated GAA levels. Elevated GAA is unique to GAMP deficiency out of all the creatine deficiency syndromes because the lack of GAMP activity results in the buildup of GAA. So when creatine mediated agot suppression, we theorize GAA levels to decrease because there is less GAA being produced from the lack of agot activity. To achieve our research methods, we took 12-week-old GAMP deficient, which I will refer to interchangeably as mutant, and wild-type mice, and we fed them either creatine-free or creatine-enriched 2 or 4% mouse chow for 10 weeks. During this 10-week period, urine and body weights were collected and measured weekly, and afterwards, organs were harvested, flash frozen, and stored at negative 80. We used the harvested organs in our biochemical investigations, where we employed various laboratory techniques, including mass spectrometry, quantitative PCR, and Western blots. To measure the metabolite levels, we used tandem mass spectrometry, and this is technology permits us to identify and calculate the amount of our target metabolites, such as GAA and creatine. To measure agot expression, we use real-time quantitative PCR or qPCR. qPCR enables us to measure the amount of target DNA in a sample, so we use it to measure the amount of agot mRNA levels, and the mRNA measurements represent the expression level of the agot gene. Finally, to measure the agot protein levels, we employed Western blots. Western blots are a technique used to separate and identify your protein of interest from a sample, and your protein is visualized by using fluorescently labeled antibodies, which recognize only your protein of interest. And so the amount of protein in a sample is proportional to the level of fluorescence that you observe. But before we could use these techniques to see the effect of creatine in the organs, we first had to verify that our creatine supplementation protocol worked. So to ensure that the mice were in fact eating the creatine and rich mouse chai, we took the body weight measurements weekly. If the mice were not eating, they would consequently lose weight. And if they did eat the chow and therefore the creatine, they would gain weight over time. So in figure one on the left, we see the percent of body mass gained every week for mice treated with 2% creatine and rich mouse chow. And likewise on the right for mice treated with 4% creatine and rich mouse chow. The figures show the percent of body mass gained relative to week zero, which is the start of our treatment. So the increase of body mass during the 10-week course of treatment increases our confidence that our creatine enrichment protocol was effective. We also see that the mutant mice gained mo more weight over the 10 weeks than the wild-type and heterozygous mice. As mentioned, we also collected the urine weekly for the 10-week creatine treatment. So in patients, metabolite measurements from the urine are used for the diagnosis. Figures three and four display the creatine and GAA levels in the two and 4% supplemented wild type and mutant mice. Each dot represents an individual mouse and the bar displays the variability among our biological replicates. So in these figures, we observe consistent depleted creatine levels and elevated GAA levels. We can confirm that these metabolite concentrations are abnormal 
by comparing them to the levels we see in our wild type mice. When we supplement with creatine, we notice both increased creatine levels and decreased GAA levels in wild type and mutant mice. In our mutant mice, we observe a GAA reduction of around 80%. Here, figures three and four display the changes in creatine and GAA levels after the 10 weeks of creatine supplementation. And here in figure five, we see the weekly measurements of GAA in our 2% treated mice and our 4% treated mice. Key to notice here in figure five is that we observe the reduction of GAA levels following one week of supplementation. And during the rest of the nine weeks, we notice that the GAA concentration is maintained and is plateaued basically. This tells us that it only takes one week for the effect of creatine supplementation to implement and that the following weeks, the creatine supplementation results in the maintenance of that concentration level. Moving on, we also measure the metabolite levels in our organs. So for now, I will show the levels from the kidney, liver, heart, and brain. So here in figure six, we see the creatine and GA concentrations from the kidney, and the same trend is observed in the kidney as we saw in the urine. With creatine supplementation, we notice observe, we observe increases in creatine and decreases in GA concentrations. We do not, however, no observe the normalization of the metabolites. So the mutant mice will still have higher GA levels than the wild type mice. In the heart, we observe a similar trend of decreasing GAA levels as we supplement with creatine, but we don't see an increase in creatine concentration in the wild type, though we do see it in the mutant. In the liver, we see some unexpected results. There is the same trend in regards to the creatine concentration, but surprisingly, we do not see the same trend in terms of GAA levels. So we would expect to see the GAA concentration decrease in the mice as we supplement with creatine. However, we do not see this. We see no effect or perhaps even an increase. Finally, in the brain, we notice the increase of creatine concentration in the mutant and the reduction of GAA in the mutant as well. The creatine concentration appears to be replenished in the brain, and while the GAA levels are reduced, they are still elevated compared to the wild type overall. So moving on from the metabolites, we also measured the agot gene and protein expressions. And so for now, I will show the qPCR and Western blots from just the kidney. So here are the relative agot mRNA levels displayed for the creatine-free and creatine-enriched treated mice. It is relative because we normalize the creatine treatment to the creatine-free expression values so that we can see the overall difference in expression. And in the wild type and in the mutant mice, we see an overall reduction of agua mRNA levels in the kidney when we supplement with creatine. We used Western blots to support the trend from qPCR and to also visualize the agua proteins. Shown here is the Western blot from the kidney. And so the intensity of the band represents the amount of target protein. So with the agua protein, the decrease in band intensity with creatine supplementation indicates a decrease in our agua protein levels. Shown below AGA is the housekeeping protein GAP-DH, and we visualize GAP-DH in order to confirm that the reduction in band intensity with AGA is due to our creatine treatment and not because of less protein being loaded overall. Overall, from these experiments, we saw that our oral creatine supplementation was digested effectively in the mice, and it resulted in increased creatine and decreased GAA in the urine, kidney, heart, and brain. Uniquely, the GAA levels in the liver are not reduced by creatine supplementation. We also observed that despite treating the creatine mice for 10 weeks, one week was sufficient for creatine supplementation to implement. Using this data, we can answer our research objectives. First, we can conclude that creatine supplementation results in increased creatine, decreased GAA, and decreases agot expression in the kidney, heart, brain, and the liver, except that GAA was not decreased in the liver. Next, the reduced agot expression and GAA levels provide evidence for the regulatory mechanism of creatine-mediated agot suppression. And finally, we can conclude that while creatine supplementation is capable of improving the abnormal metabolite levels of creatine and GAA in GAMP deficiency, it is not capable of normalizing those levels to be equal to those of the wild type. And increasing the percent of creatine supplementation does not appear to aid in normalization. 
This highlights that creatine supplementation is a beneficial treatment, but that there is a need for alternate methods for metabolite normalization and GAMP deficiency. Thank you. Thanks so much, Madeline. Um, I think this was wonderful. And because we actually have a couple of minutes, um, Alex, I know you had um, a little bit more information, but I wonder before we open the session for everyone, um, if you can quickly summarize some of the take-home messages. And particularly, I think one way to, to discuss this is we're, you're getting some very interesting results that delivery of creatine to the brain intranasally um, is going through even without the creatine transporter. Do you have a hypothesis of why that's the case? And do you see all brain cells affected similarly? Sure. Uh, let me see. Okay, let me, sorry, you can hear me, right? So yes. let me, let me, thank you. Let, let me pick up where I was earlier. So I think we did international treatment and then we show we can increase the brain the concentration of creatine. And then we see a fact like a reduction of emphasis and also reduction of the reduced blood flow. And also chemically, we showed, let me see, the suppressed uh, caspase uh, activation and like MPK activation. So we see some of that. As I showed you earlier in my previous slide, that is, uh, let me see, in the creatine knockout neuron, they can still pick up the creatine from the median. So we think although the creatine deficient neuron in the brain, they, they may not able to get the high amount of creatine, but they will still get some creatine and which will facilitate that, okay, let me see the, and then basically that in the creatine deficiency state that there's a creatine clamp. So mTOR signal is reduced, MPK autophagy increase, chronic activation, this kind of imbalance, I think will lead to the, okay, the dendritic spine synapse reduction, which may contribute to cognitive deficit. And then if, uh, let me see, for this, then we think international application of this uh, creatine will bypass barber barrier and deliver creatine into the brain and then eventually be picked up by a neuron to protect against the acute brain injury. Whether this can be used for chronic treatment, we need to consider the age and reversibility of this structure of normality. So that's another total issue. But one thing which I think very interesting that is usually considered this, we put in the creatine, which doesn't contain high energy forceful bond. So where does the energy come from, right? Okay, so we think what have really happened, that is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, creating a uh, fossil creating is a shuttle between the ATP production, also the ATP consumption. But actually, I think it's also, you can think about this a shuttle magnet, like a lubricant or stimulator. There was studies show before, creating can directly stimulate the mitochondrial function. So it's like a lubricant or like a merry-go-round, keep the mitochondrial function. So when you do not, when the cell lack of creatine, when the ATP use up then, so we're gonna stop, mitochondria will stop there to generate more ATP for energy uh, consumption. That's how I feel actually, that is the eventual most important function for this phosphor creatine shuttle in terms of maintain cellular mitochondrial function. That's it. Thanks, Alex, and I appreciate you um, being flexible with us here. Thank you. Um, so I would like to invite all of the all of the speakers and um, and Nicola to join us, so that we can proceed with um, with questions for everyone. Yeah, I want to thank. So Nicola, you should go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank all of the speakers for the beautiful presentation. Really nice, and I think that you know one element that it is emerging is that even in creatine transporter deficiencies, there might be accumulation of guanidino acetate, at least in some cell within the brain. Uh, I'm going on directly with the question, and I'm starting with Dr. Girardini that received the most of them, because you know, obviously she has shown the result of intracerebral intraventricular injection of the uh, uh, vector, and this has been attempted in other neurological disorders in humans. So uh, the, the, one of the question is, uh, uh, how many neurons can you potentially target, or what percentage of neurons can you target with this one? And the second question, is there a way of increasing the targeting of the transgene by modifying the vector that you're using? Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, they're both very interesting. So the first question about how many neurons we can reasonably target, 
I have to, my, my straight answer is I don't know yet because we haven't performed the experiments yet. Um, however, we believe that at least with intracerebral uh, administration, the targeting might be quite high. The problem might not be, uh, in, at, at least, I mean, with the high doses. In our case, in particular, with the approach that we use, the high doses definitely don't work because they go together with high toxicity due to, and we are still trying to find out the answer to, to this question, what is causing toxicity. Um, so I believe that at least with intracerebral um, deliver, we can target a very high amount of neuron. Then the effect that we obtain depends on many factors, for example, the, the characteristics of the vector, uh, the type of correction that we want to implement. So I believe that um, the number of cells might not be the main problem in terms of efficacy of gene therapy approaches. It's probably a more subtle um, issue of um, regulating how the gene is expressed, where the gene is expressed, and how to regulate the expression. Because of course, we, uh, with all these approaches that we are using so far, including those that are already um, on the market as therapies there are a few uh, for different uh, neurological diseases. I think we have three of them or something like that. Uh, they use ubiquitous promoters because the idea is let's give a lot of gene product because this is needed. Um, what we are seeing is at least in our case, this might be a dangerous solution. So we probably have to focus more on this type of subtle regulation instead of Mm, thinking that maybe we're not targeting enough cells, because I believe that with high doses, of course, in proof of concept experiments in animal models where we can actually uh, administer them intracerebrally, because that, that is something that you cannot do in the patients. But in this case, I don't think the problem is the targeting of neurons, I think it's something else. As for the second question about what to do to improve the vector, I think that mm, there is not so much that we can do yet in terms of capsid um, generation, or there is, but uh, the tools that we have so far are not so selective for subclasses of cells within the brain. So I believe that capsid um, uh, pseudotyping is probably more important to generate vectors that are less toxic, especially when administered uh, systemically. Uh, my feeling, my personal feeling is that it's more important to act on the characteristics of the gene and its regulation once it's inside the cells. And in that case, I would say we have to work on the promoter, we have to work on, um, well, also splicing might be an issue. I'm not sure about the splicing on, of the creatine transporter. There are different splicing variants, but they have been poorly characterized so far. That's also an interesting thing. So we should know how the splicing works. So if we give the coding sequence of the gene, maybe we are missing out on something that is important in this regard. Uh, the promoter, as I said already, um, maybe sites for microRNA regulation or regulations from non-coding RNAs. Uh, I believe that these are characteristics that need to be implemented. Um, whereas for the capsid version, I think is more important for the deliver route and for avoiding toxic phenomena, especially when administered uh, systemically. Thank you. There are more questions for you, but I'm going to ask a few to Madeline because I have her here. And Madeline, a very impressive work for a student and, you know, above and beyond. So uh, the, one of the questions that people had is, most children and adults with GAMP deficiency are already taking a lot of creatine as part of their therapy. Do you think there could be additional suppression of the expression of the AGAT gene beyond the one that we're already seeing with the doses that we are giving to uh, currently to this patient to reduce further the synthesis of guanidino acetate? And the second question, that uh, came by is uh, there was a weight gain after giving uh, creatine supplementation. Do you know how much of the weight gain is due to water, fat, muscle, uh, or, or uh, whichever? So two questions. One has to do, can, can we get more of the suppression of GAA with, uh, beyond what we are doing currently? And the second one, any change in fat, muscle, or water that was measured in the animal? 
Okay, so for the first question, I know that if you keep increasing the creatine supplementation, you will get reduced agot gene and protein expression. However, there is a limit to how much creatine can be kind of dissolved and uptaken in your in patients. So increasing it indefinitely to extremely high concentrations will not completely get rid of agot levels. And so while it can reduce agot expression, it can eliminate agot expression. So increasing it definitely will not get rid of that. And so that's why you kind of need other, that's why my research shows is you need other mechanisms to completely eliminate GAA levels. Like you can reduce it, but you cannot normalize the levels, even if as you keep increasing. And then for the second question, I'm not quite sure about the composition of the body weight because these were the body weights of mice we have not yet sacrificed and so we haven't analyzed their organs yet but yeah thank you very much uh, dr kwan yes we cannot really see you sorry i have some problem with my camera <laughs> sorry about that you no know, we know you are there okay okay yes Not yes worried. thank you so it was a very intriguing talk and you know and you. one of the issue is the fact that you know they the cell uh, or uh, lacking creatine seems to be more sensitive to lack of oxygen and lack of right. glucose right. my question is different would the keto diet the ketogenic diet you know we know you we use ketogenic diet not just for uh, uh, for some metabolic disorder, I'm a metabolic physician. We use that many times to treat seizure independently from the cause. Right. Do you think that it could bypass, in part, the lack of activation of mTOR and lead to reduce autophagocytosis in this cell and possibly to improve outcome? Uh, I, I must say, it's just my humble opinion or my guess, okay. I think actually, so let me see, although ketone body can be a way to regenerate the ADP, but eventually you still need to go through the oxidative phosphorylation. So eventually you still need to convert to ATP. So I think the whole thing that is when you lack the creating as a shutter to kick the mitochondrial engage to be engaged to work. I think doesn't matter whether you fit it with the pyruvate or fit it with ketone body. I think the ADP production will still be impaired, number one. Number two, I, I did I simplify this a little bit. So when the ATP is converted to ADP, one proton will be be released. So unless that is being used by the phosphocreatine to, to, to recycle this. Also, quite trying to say that even without the phosphocreatine, okay, and then the cell acidity will go very high when the older ATP is consumed to ADP. So I think that's another aspect why the phosphocreatine system is important. So I thought creating you know, body will be sufficient to rescue. Perfect, but obviously using a, a, a inhibitor of mTOR, such as some of the drugs that we use in the uh, uh, prevention of uh, uh, transplant or this type of right. uh, uh, rejection, be contraindicated yeah. in patients with any type of creatine deficiency syndrome. Mm -hmm. Seems to me, yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Also, Girardini, getting back to you, there are another thousand questions for you, but let me go one by one. And Can I quickly ask one from a parent perspective, just, um, um, and it's probably a very uh, um, basic question, Elsa, but um, how do you observe the seizures in the mice? And could some of these seizures appear as um, fainting spells or something that's not visible, right? So this again comes from like a, a parent that is wondering where is the separation between like seizure activity and something that is not quite a seizure. Uh, you are mute. I forgot to activate the microphone. So um, the way we measure seizures in mice is, um, is duplex because we run the EEG in freely moving animals for 24 hours. And at the same time, we have a camera observing the animal with, who is fairly moving so we can observe behaviorally as well as with an EEG what happens in the brain. And of course, this gives us a very, the very high resolution of the EEG measuring because of course we can see alterations in the 
electric activity of the brain before it becomes obvious and apparent in terms of uh, behaviorally uh, evident seizures. But, uh, and in fact, when we evaluate the spontaneous seizures, most of them are more evident at the EEG level than at the behavioral level. They become very obvious when we do the uh, induced epileptic studies, when we administer kinate that elicit seizures. In that case, we can see the actual seizures and we mostly see, well, we actually, we see the whole spectrum of different type of seizures from tonic, clonic, and both of them, which is the most severe. Whereas when we evaluate the spontaneous seizures, it's more related to the EEG pattern and the behavioral pattern. Sometimes it's very subtle also because we are observing mice and sometimes the behavior of a mouse is not so obvious. Sometimes very mild seizures can uh, manifest just with the animal that stays completely still. And in that case, you really have to be there and evaluate if that being still is something that is just a normal behavior or uh, <clears throat> an, an, an anomaly like a seizure. So it's, it's difficult by only looking at the behavior. EEG definitely helps us. Thank you. Then one of the questions was, do you, have you identified some of the uh, potassium channel or other channels involving some of the downside that you see? And the, the, the second question observation is, do you think that the toxicity that you observe is due to the vector or to the expression of the transgene? Okay. <clears throat> so for the first question, um, we are seeing uh, when we look at our uh, single nucleus RNA sequencing data, a few of these potassium and sodium channels as differentially expressed. So the first hint that we have to look into these channels come from our data, which, however, have to be taken with a pinch of salt because, um, because of the technique itself, sometimes it's not very easy to see whether the alterations that you, that you observe in statistically over a big number of different genes is actually significant. So we have uh, indications that a few channels might be altered off the top of my head. I remember, for example, um, HCN1 or CND2 or even some uh, auxiliary subunits regulating these channels. And all these channels that I mentioned are also related to um, pathologies, uh, mutations in the channels, in these channels are often uh, associated to forms of epilepsy or something like that. So it's interesting to know that we're observing alterations in channels that are important to uh, for the regulation of neural excitability. However, we need to validate this data. So ideally, we would need to screen all the possible interesting channels that we see altered and go one by one to validate them first in cells and then possibly in vivo to see if that alteration that we get from the um, uh, single nucleus RNA sequencing is an actual alteration and if any significant. But we do have this database to search for that. And we are seeing all these alterations already, especially in potassium channels. And- Oh, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just answering the second question. Um, I will be quite short. Um, we believe that the main problem is the expression of the transgene itself because of the timing in which we observe toxicity. Because we start seeing toxicity after uh, 20 days um, so after the administration, so when mice are 20 days old, uh, which means that this is a period in which the transgene starts to be expressed. And therefore, we believe that is the expression itself that is toxic. If it was the virus, we would expect to see mortality also at earlier stages, possibly immediately, but we don't see that. So we actually are more inclined to think that is a transgene problem rather than a, an immune reaction or a virus problem. I hope I, I answered the question. Oh, that was great. And this conversation is very, very valuable. I think the point of these conferences is to bring people together. And I know officially we have a break. So folks, if you want to grab a cup of coffee, go for it or tea or whatever, you know, do what you need to do. But I think Dr. Lo uh, Nicola, if you're up for it, we can continue with the questions and people can come in and go for the next 10 minutes or so. And we just need to come back at like 1045 for, for the next session. So if our speakers are okay with staying longer, um, okay. Nicola, you should, you should continue to plow through the questions. <laughs> So I need to continue to, uh, to ask questions, is that correct? Unless you get tired and then we can, we can put some oh. nice elevator music. <laughs> so.
so I'm perfectly fine. So uh, I think that, uh, so, but for example, did you try injecting the mice just with the vector with a different transgene, a random one, to, to uh, clarify your hypothesis and to see if that was real or not? And the second question is what we do in vivo usually we give when we do give gene therapy to humans we give uh, immunosuppression so far we have been giving mostly steroid mm -hmm. are you giving any type of therapy to mice before giving the gene therapy i haven't seen that done in any other gene therapy but you know i'm asking just in case and these are again two very interesting questions so um can you quickly remind me the first <laughs> sorry <laughs> So the, the first, first question, did you give any steroid or any immunosuppressive okay. therapy to these mice before so, injecting them? No, we didn't also because we administered the vector in the newborn and that would be difficult. Uh, I know that this is an issue. However, we are still at the proof of concept uh, stage. So we thought that by administering the vector um, straight intracerebrally, we wouldn't uh, have as many issues in terms of immune reactions that we would have by administering the virus systemically. Um, so no, we didn't do that. Uh, but of course, this might be an issue. We would have to study the inflammation levels overall uh, to realize whether this is a problem. And, and in that case, of course, that would be that would need to be addressed for sure. And for the for the um, administration with an unrelated vector. Yes, we actually, we have been doing these experiments recently when we administered mice also with a vector encoding for GFP and, and that's it, under the same promoter, under the CAG promoter uh, at the same titer. And we didn't observe any toxicity. Mice behave normally, uh, meaning that the knockout had lower performances compared to the wild type. Of course, we have only few data on few individuals uh, to date, so I didn't include them in the presentation, but the indication is no. Uh, with unrelated vectors, we don't have the toxicity that we experience with the uh, CRT uh, encoding vectors. So we still believe that it's a problem of the transgene expression. So we really need to figure out what the creatine transporter does and how much Indeed. we need of it, because, you know, Indeed. too much is probably toxic as well as it is too little. So we really need to work on that number. One of the questions that was posed is, do you know if the sodium potassium ATPase function is affected in the brain of the creatine transporter deficiency mice? Uh, this is an interesting question because that would have to, that would explain some of the problems in terms of excitability that we observe. We observe lower excitability in the provalbumin neurons, and I didn't show this data, but we have data showing enhanced excitability of the excitatory pyramidal neurons uh, and is a autonomous mechanisms because these are patch clamping experiments. So we only see the in, in the cell autonomous properties of the single neurons. Um, but we haven't checked that. So my answer is no, we haven't looked at that yet, but that's definitely one of the mechanisms that could be responsible for it especially considering that uh, this uh, pump uses a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. So we would expect its function to be altered in case of starv starving cells as we have in the CTD brain. So that's an, an interesting thing to look at. Uh, thank you. Dr. Juan, if you are still on, the intranasal administration sounds really very promising. How do you have to modify the creatine? How do you have to uh, make it soluble? W what do you put that in to allow the intranasal administration of creatine? And how often would it have to be given in a human to be effective? How many times in one day? <laughs> Sorry, this is a way, way far down the line. I have not considered this question yet, but I can only tell you in terms of the human treatment, but I can only tell you for this uh, mice that we actually, we, as you can see, we on purpose, uh, we select, let me see, the acute injury, acute outcome measurement, because honestly, I do not know if I want to use this approach to treat, let me see, like a, like a improved cognitive function in a creatine mutant knockout mice, how long do I need it? And also another thing that is the change, the structural change is reversible now. Do I start earlier being effective, but study late, how late it will become ineffective, I do not know. 
and then for the intranatal treatment uh, in the mice per se, uh, basically, I, if I remember correct, I think we just use saline to to dissolve the creatine into the, and then we did not add a particular other than let me see the adjuvant to improve for the penetration. But I recall the words uh, the uh, the word study suggesting that if you add some particular chemical that will improve the intranasal penetration efficiency, which uh, I think when we go to the clean translation study, that that could be something to consider. That's it. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question for Madeline. Uh, Madeline, did you actually measure the plasma level of creatine that you could achieve in your mice? Uh, I mean, I've seen the measurement in all tissue, but my question is, what is the plasma level of creatine? Simply because we do measure le creatine level in patients who have GAMP deficiency, so we know what we can reach uh, reasonably in humans. Uh, no, we didn't measure the plasma concentration. Thank you. Good answer. Uh, so uh, there is also a comment by, by Dr. Tom DeGraw that has been posted here that uh, present the neurology uh, point of view about seizure that uh, said that they are caused by an imbalance between uh, excitation and inhibition. And uh, uh, most of most seizures have um, uninhibited excitatory neurons that just keep stimulating the brain. And uh, absent seizures uh, are likely caused by activation of inhibitory neurons. So both type of neuron could contribute to seizure. And we have seen before in certain slides that both of them can be affected somehow by the, the lack of creatine. And also, it, it confirmed the fact that, you know, while many seizures, especially in animal models, cannot be seen very well, most of them are captured by an EEG that remains the most sensitive way of capturing seizure in uh, uh, animal model and probably in humans as well. Sometimes in humans, you have seizure without seeing them, and sometimes you have uh, EEG seizure without seizure. But you know, but in general, that it is exactly what, what that is. Uh, uh, there was a question about using CRISPR-Cas9 as a way of uh, resolving the abnormal creatine transporter in the brain. So in other words, if one could get CRISPR-Cas9 inside the brain and correct the abnormal creatine transporter, obviously the, that creatine transporter would be normally regulated and not at risk of overexpression. And Dr. Storghirardini, are you trying to use CRISPR-Cas9 to correct point mutation? So in, in your animal, actually, it would be kind of hard to correct because you're missing a whole chunk Yes, but you know, a point mutation would be a more reasonable target. Of course, I believe that, for example, in the knocking model that mm, Professor Brissan and uh, Dr. Duran use, this would be a, a very interesting option to go because, as you said, that would only um, it would only take a small, tiny correction on the very mutation side avoiding all the problems of uh, overexpression of a transgene and so on and so forth. So yes, I believe that that's very interesting. We cannot do that with our mouse, but um, I hope that this is a, an option that will be evaluated soon. Of course, it's not easy to use CRISPR-Cas with gene therapy yet because of the, well, because of the size of the transgenes and the fact that you need to, uh, to infect with multiple vectors, of course. But, but that's a pro, um, an approach that has been trying. It, it, it's being tried already. So I hope uh, someone will do that. Someone will try that with suitable models. Fine. I think that I want to thank all of the presenter and the panelists for answering the question. Uh, we are going to take a, a, a real five minute <laughs> break and we will Thank be you. back at, uh, at uh, the 45 marks time zone, depending where you are. Okay. Thank you Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.